So, really, really excited to be with my good, great friend, John Katzman, who has been a friend of mine for too long to admit, mm -hmm. three decades, I think. Um, John is, I'm sure the listeners know, has been an extraordinary entrepreneur in the education space, started Princeton Review right out of Princeton. Uh, then then there was this, the founder of To You, and now has the noodle con, uh, conglomeration of, of different education businesses. Is that a fair way to, to describe it? It, Not, is. it is. And how are you? I'm great. Great. You look great. Ditto. So talk about, I mean, how did you get involved and interested in being an education entrepreneur to begin with? You know, I started Princeton Review because I'd done some tutoring in college, and it seemed like a great, fun thing to do that could make me some money while I started a software company. And um, so when I moved to the city, I, I worked on Wall Street for about six weeks. I said, like, well, that's not fun. You and, and, Michael, you and Michael Lewis. There you go. And Also Princeton grad. Uh, he was. And, uh, and then it just was compelling. Right. Like, uh, first of all, test prep is compelling because real education, you're spending so much time in K-12 trying to motivate kids. But here they were wildly motivated. Right. You just had to channel that anxiety into constructive action. And uh, and people were willing to pay you, which is the other problem in K-12 education. So it just seemed like a great fun thing to do. The company grew very quickly. And I had a three year plan to sell it for 20 years. Yeah, uh, it right. just, it just, you know, was, was fun. And then, you know, over time you start seeing as higher, you know, education, not just higher ed, but as this great target rich environment, it's so important. It's so flawed. The people are so good. And, and so it's like an intriguing puzzle. Talk about, so, you know, and again, everybody knows Princeton Review um, is a, you know, very successful test prep business, but you had some challenges in the early days. And one of them was you had a, a, a group that wasn't such a fan of, of helping take tests better. You know, the college board has been right from the start, a, a really problematic organization. And yeah, they were upset because the claim was this was an IQ test and there was no way to prep. And if you were prepping kids, you were cheating. Um, and it didn't work anyway. Um, you know, we'd say, well, why don't we do a study together to see if it's working? And yeah. they would say, well, we don't want to do that because we would just legitimize you. Yeah. So they could make a point of sort of being blind to the data and they continue to sort of have that attitude. But but they also, if you think about the notion of the SAT, it's 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 based on a couple of principles. And and this is true also of Common Core and of any kind of top-down uh, regimen. Number one, every kid should learn the same thing, right? And when you talk about Common Core, the same thing at the same time. And number two, we know what it is. Right. And number three, and it doesn't change from year to year. And when you really think about those, that, that's, that's, they're all moronic, right? Those are crazy things. And so yeah. somebody pointing that out is sort of bothersome to them. But the fact is, they really are moronic principles. And we have to rethink how we measure education. So will you tell the story because they were kind of, they were big, you know, a lot of big company, a lot of resources, and they wanted to make your life difficult. And then you got a break with the New York Times reporter that kind of got wind of this, wind of the David versus Goliath. Well, they um, they put like uh, twenty or thirty private investigators into the course in different parts of the country, and they um, got all my course materials and they went through them. And there were like probably three thousand test questions that we gave yeah. as part of prepping somebody. And they found that, I don't know, 13 or 15 of them were very close, very, very close to questions that had appeared on a real SAT. Yeah. And, you know, that was an error, right? We, they could have just said, you know, these questions are a little too close, yeah. cut it out. Um, but it gave them a great way to go to court. And a stack of papers that was, you know, a foot thick appeared on my doorstep and 
the first hearing I had this uh, five foot three woman representing me and they had literally 11 guys who had to be like six, three and above. It was like a fucking football field. <laughs> and, and it was utterly intimidating yeah. to, to both of us actually. And, and then, you know, you see the case and then you dig through all the papers and you realize it's about a handful of test quests, a couple handfuls. And, uh, And then I got a call from the Times, and they were going to do an article about it. Yeah. And I, I, I said, you know, I'd love to come in and and talk about it. And, um, and he's asking questions. This is a guy named Jim Maroff, who was a, a great educational reporter. And I said, well, look, I I can tell you about it. It's really about a dozen questions, and and they're not even all that similar. And he goes, well, they look pretty similar to me. And he pulls out from under his desk. All the stuff from the lawsuit, right. which ETS had sealed, oh. and the college board had sealed with the the court. Yeah. And I said, "Where'd you get that?" And well, they gave it to me. Oh wow! So we went back to the judge, who was Donald Trump's sister, <laughs> um, which was weird. And uh, even then, yeah. yeah, and 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 said like they, yeah. you know, they're they're playing you. Right. And she released all the papers. And uh, and a we went back to the Times and said, OK, those are that's 15 questions. Here's the rest of the case. Right. That's all they got. And they wrote a lovely front page article. Basically, the subtext was, why is the college board so afraid of this little test prep company? And we ran off uh, 70 or 80 straight great articles. We quadrupled the size of the company in three months and. The rest is they history. En- and the rest is history. I mean, they ended up settling the case for fifty thousand bucks, and we apologized and about those questions. But um, the arrogance, yeah. Well, it, it, it's amazing. So, next, next uh, on your entrepreneurial hit list to you. Well, I remember driving around Silicon Valley, and it was raining out, and you had this this kind of revolutionary idea. You were going around Sand Hill Road, knocking on doors, looking to, to have people invest. How, how did that come about? I remember you making introductions. I exactly know who uh, we were on our way to see. Um, I got a call. I was still running the review, and I got a call from uh, a good friend who um, who said, USC is looking for somebody to donate a chair in um in education entrepreneurship and i in the ed school and i said that's funny because schools of ed aren't the solution to entrepreneurship and education they're part of the problem yeah. and and no and so he went back to the dean who was this fabulous still is this fabulous woman uh karen gallagher and she said, well, that's an interesting thing to say. You know, do you want to sit down and have lunch? Because A, she was fabulous. B, she was a good salesperson. Right. Um, and we sat down and she convinced me that we're not going to just have somebody who writes white papers about entrepreneurs. But like, we're USC. We are elite but muscular and able to actually do things. And we're interested in doing something. And I thought that was fabulous and ended up. Uh, funding the chair and ended up in this long, you know, year long conversation with her and her team about what it would look like to do something entrepreneurial in education. Um, and that's kind of how we created to you, like the original contract and the structure of how you would, how a great university would go online at scale with high quality and yet um, impact. Uh, it was all just sitting with Karen. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you look at, you basically created a whole industry, you know, with, with that, with, with that move. Well, I, I knew that if a school as elite as USC was, if they were willing to do it, it gave permission for a lot of other schools to do it because they understood that, you know, online education was crap because the school's doing it were not good and their classroom programs weren't good either. Like it was just, 
But the medium itself was fine. Every new medium starts out with porn, right? The first photos ever taken were naked women. And, and then mainstream comes in behind that. And you knew there's nothing wrong with online education. You just need real educators to do it. Yeah. Um, so it became a thing. I can reimagine what, how that medium is going to work to, to basically interact with, as opposed to just repurposing online. That's right. And, you know, there's still a lot of terrible online education and lessons that have been learned that people don't want to accept. Like, I'm, I'm still a skeptic on all asynchronous. Like, I don't like the graduation rates. I don't like any, like, I ask any number of people for long-term kind of longitudinal data. Okay, what percent graduated of the people who did graduate versus the people who didn't versus the people who applied and didn't go or went to your on-ground program? What do their careers look like 10 years later? Like, what was the actual return on investment? Because the data on higher ed is so good, right, in terms of income and, and life happiness and everything. I mean, higher ed is the great success story that we can crap all over every day, but, you know, the data is compelling. Online higher ed, if you pull apart all asynchronous with synchronous and asynchronous with, you know, uh, uh, sometimes going on campus. I think you're going to see that there's good and there's bad and, and, and the kind of outcomes you would expect are baked into the design of the program. I want to talk about Noodle in a second, but when you look at today, universities that are doing it right, who are some examples you cite? You know, everybody points to ASU and they're an easy one to point out because they're, they have now, they're elite, but kind of a muscular willingness to take risk, willingness to go to scale that, uh, you know, that very few schools are willing to do. You know, Paul in Southern New Hampshire is doing some incredible stuff. Like I, those guys are playing in a different league, but you look at, um, you look at schools like University of, of Tennessee, Knoxville, mm. right? And their chancellor and their team are really thoughtful about kind of addressing and thinking through a lot of the problems where you're starting as an elite school, where everything you do is going to get watched by faculty, by alums, you know, and, and there's a lot to lose. You're not starting from a school that um, is either on the ropes like Southern New Hampshire was before Paul got there or um, or not at all elite, so no reputational kind of risk. You look at schools that that have a lot to lose and are still willing to play, yeah. still willing to experiment. That's really exciting. So talk about Noodle, how Noodle came about. Um. I took Princeton Review public, and it turns out I was a terrible public company <laughs> CEO, and um, and I hated it. Uh, so it was it was mutual. Well, yeah. well, I think the, what people a lot of people don't appreciate is there's very few people that are really good at founding, creating businesses that have, are really great at running them as a public business because that's a whole different skill set. It is a different skill set, and I applaud the people who can do it. And I came to know that I was not one of them. So I. Um, when I had the idea for To You, I originally brought it to my board. I'd already brought in professional management and they all crapped all over the idea. And I think they were kind of done with me. Um, so I started it as a, as a new company. I got them to, to give me permission. Um, and To You went well. And at some point the board said, it's time to get ready to go public. And they had every right to do that. And they'd invested a lot of money. Um, and my feeling was, I'm not your guy. Like, I'm, I'm about to Peter Principal out. Um, let me appoint my successor. Let me step out to the board for a year. And, and, uh, and when I left, I left in a perfectly good mood. And we we're all friends. And I still had very, very close friends in the company. And then I watched the company make a left turn. And I watched the industry make a left turn and it really upset me. And it was 
that the model, because the whole idea of 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 in, of, of of incubating a a new thing within these established universities, you really tried to keep it protected, was somewhat opaque in terms of where the operating metrics were, what we were spending, what we were spending it on, and uh, which was fine because my goal was, I'm going to market you to the point of economic indifference. As long as it doesn't cost me money to get you a kid, I'm going to go get you highly qualified applicants. And if And if they're not highly qualified, you reject them. Like that's, I don't want to be part of you dumbing down your school. Um, what the industry did is they said, well, we're going to have lots and lots of clients. And, and they said, we have a fiduciary duty to market the programs that are most profitable to us. Mm. Right? If we're going to spend a dollar in marketing, let's spend it in a place where it will have greatest return. return. Which meant that all of the really good programs that were selective and inexpensive got smoked, Mm -hmm. right? Like like the money that they spent marketing them, you know, they would cut by 80%. And the programs that were from good schools, but were not selective, were really expensive. That's where all the money went. And when they went down that road, it made me insane. Mm -hmm. Like... uh, I built to you to be a good, and I felt like no, now we are part of the problem. And mm-hmm. uh, and I left, and I you know with some rage. Um. And when my non compete expired, I I founded Noodle to be a next generation OPM. How do we be more transparent, more flexible? And more efficient. How do we save schools money and do so in a way that that when I leave, the next guy can't make that same left turn? So, what do you think of the Department of Education's dear colleagues letter? And what do you, th- do you have any crystal ball in terms of what you think ultimately happens there? Yeah, I you know, the, Noodle has evolved, and and we see ourselves now as simply a, a tech enabled service and strategy provider. And we do all the things that OPM does. We can apply them to a specific problem like launching an online program, but we can also apply them to growing your presence in the lifelong learning space or solving the nursing shortage or, you know, any number of things. But we can do it without a rev share. I think um, the Dear Colleague letter, which was an exception to incentive comp rules, um, has has been more abused than used over the past five or six years and needs to go away. So if you think about incentive comp, it was a Department of Ed reg that said, look, what you're doing is paying admissions people to admit everybody. Right. And so they're admitting everybody, including a bunch of people who shouldn't be there. You can't do that anymore. And then people said, well... It was kind of like the, what happened during the mortgage crisis where you had the people basically said it's the subprime. Them. Right. Yeah. These are subprime students. Right. And, and, and then those same schools said, well, we're not going to pay them. We're going to hire somebody and we'll pay them on a success basis and whatever they do is fine. And they said, well, you can't do that either. Right. So it, it is specifically you can't pay on a per student, per applicant, or anything like it basis. You can you can advertise, you can pay CPMs, you can pay per click or per lead, but that's it. The dear colleague letter said, if you are bundling a bunch of services, marketing, learning design, technology support, then you can be incentivized by success, then you can take a percentage of of revenue. What happened is all of a sudden people started saying, well, what does a bundle really mean? It means we're doing marketing and recruiting and we're giving you this candidate code. That's a bundle. And, uh, And so what we've created is the rule is you can't incentivize someone. You can't 
pay someone to generate students, except when you include the can't Diet Coke, then you can. So the exception to the rule is now exactly the size of the rule. Yeah. And so you either got to get rid of the rule and say, well, all bets are off. Anybody can pay on any basis, or you've got to say the rule stands. And the rule was there for a reason. It's a good rule. They should go back to it. Yeah. So talk about school ratings. I mean, what do you, do you, I mean, the U.S. News and World, and when you were at Prince Review, you had school ratings. Yep. What's your view on, on, on that? Are there, is there anything, what improvements would you make to have something that was was uh, valuable. We, um, I didn't mean to apply they're not valuable. No, 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 no. And I, I love the rankings Prince Review did. Like they, they were fun. Yeah. They were based on actual data. We surveyed a quarter million kids. Yeah. Um, and yet they were very clear that this is not scientific. Yeah. We're just pulling it right out of our ass. And, <laughs> and they are what they are. Yeah. Right. But they were, they were directionally correct. Right. Um, Not just in higher ed, but education is really, really hard to measure stuff that's important. And, and so what we do is we measure all the wrong stuff. We're the drunk guy looking for the keys under the light, right? right? Like, and so we think that that's better than nothing, but it might not be. And it incentivizes all the wrong behaviors. So the starting point is... What are you trying to do, let's say for higher ed? What are you trying to do and are you successful doing it? And here in 2023, you can drill down to for this kid. Kids like you, students like you, coming into a program like this, this is what we're trying to do for you. And this is our track record of doing it. And so you have programs where the answer is, Next year, you're going to make a lot of money, right? Like that's the point of this program is we're going to put you into this profession that's and you're promise. going to get paid this. That's the promise. Right. And then you can measure it. And someone coming in who's like you, who has your education background, this is what percent graduate and this is what percent make the kind of money we're saying you're going to make. And you can tell students really precisely who you are. And to me... The next generation of accreditation is really about that. It's not some sort of average, which really rewards you for bringing in this kind of student, right? Who's no matter what you do, you can't screw it up. Right. And says, show me your, show me your, your, your real goals. Show the student your real goals and show them that you're going to hit them. And when we start thinking of accreditation that way, which is really the roots of accreditation, right? Every school's different. And the same thing I was saying about, about the problem with, you know, Common Core or the SAT, that everybody's different and they have different goals, among other things. Every school has different goals. The philosophy department at Harvard, the nursing school at community college, they're fundamentally serving different students with different goals. One size doesn't fit both of those, but they know who they are. And they can describe what they're trying to do. And we're good enough with data right now to be able to say, who are they good at doing that with and who are they not good at doing that with? So, you know, I've told you for basically as long as I've known you, you should be in politics. You should be mayor of New York. Um, we might come from a different um, persuasion, but I would vote for you uh, and be your campaign manager because I, I, I think you'd be fantastic. But if you, if you were in... in Government, what can government do to make education better for everybody? And I know that's a broad question. There's K twelve, there's higher, there's workforce learners, all. But what, what, what do you what do you think would be kind of the cornerstone pieces of things you'd want to get done? So there there are three markets, and they have completely different problems, and the solutions would be completely different. And by the way, that was very kind, and thank you. And the fact that I've cursed several times in this conversation suggests that maybe politics isn't where I should go. Mm -hmm. um, K-12 has an efficacy problem, right? Where there are a bunch of kids, we do a bad job teaching. Um, higher ed has a cost problem. And the space between K-12 and higher ed has a, it's not very well defined. And we've 
we've just got to think it through as an entity and stop trying to pretend that high school and college butt together like stones in a pyramid. They don't. There's space between and we have to address it. So the government solution on the first one is districts are a mistake. Giving a geographic monopoly to an organization, you could have predicted 70 years ago, this is exactly what's going to happen. Adam Smith 101 stuff, and it's all happened. And we have to we have to think through the governance of K-12. We don't need to change the schools. We don't need to change the teachers. We need to change everything above that on how we govern schools. And I have a whole bunch of thoughts as to how to do that, but 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 the key is we do it patiently. We think about what the actual metrics we're looking for. If I got 50 people in a room and said, what are the goals of K-12 education? I could get them all to agree, right? They would say, over the next 40 years, the guys who go, the people who go to this school should have jobs that, um, that they like and pay a living wage. As the economy changes, they should be able to get new jobs because they're agile. Mm -hmm. They should be happy as measured by suicide rates, alcoholism, deaths of despair, as measured by just satisfaction surveys like Gallup does. Yeah. And they should be good members of society. They should vote. They shouldn't go to prison. Right? Like, and you could tweak that and you can like, right. you know, add some uh, nuance to it. But basically, we don't measure any of those things. They're all highly measurable. And we don't say, what did we do to these kids? What curricular choices did we make? How did we structure schools? What are we doing? And what translated into the kind of outcomes we're looking for? And we don't have to wait 40 years, by the way. You're, you're going to see it developing like a gift does. Mm -hmm. Like It's fuzzy at first, but who are the kids? A lot of the people who go to prison are going to go there pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. People are going to drop out. You kind of know where that's going. Like you, you see it over time, but not... Decades. So the starting point would be um, patiently, no quick fixes. We try a controlled experiment. In your state, we're going to take a couple hundred schools and run them through this Department of Ed with a completely new set of regs that picks up on everything we learned in the charter movement, everything we learned in the accountability movement, plus and minus. Mm. And and then we're going to match them to schools that are running under the current regimen. And over the next 10 years, how do we do? Right. And where do the kids end up? And what kind of teacher satisfaction do we have? What kind of parent satisfaction? Like what happens? And I believe we can govern schools better than we're doing it. If we stop trying to do quick fixes, if we start by what are the things to measure these two systems against uh, that matter? And then, you know, different set of things for higher ed. Yeah, cost. So what do you think of, man, there's no good, $1.6 trillion of student debt. It's crazy. You've got tuition that's increased, you know, two and a half times inflation for the past 40 years. Um, okay, so, so number one. Yes. We have a huge perception problem. Yeah. The cost of higher ed. I'm sorry if I've helped cause that. but No, <laughs> no. Well, now I'm going to correct you. Okay, good. Um. The cost of higher ed yeah. has been flat to inflation for 20 plus years. Has been flat to inflation for over 20 years and no one knows it. So what happened is for reasons we'll talk about, schools have been jacking up their tuition by inflation plus two or three points a year for all this time. And you can say they're doing it so that they look more elite. They're actually doing it because they're taking that money and giving it to the less advantaged kids because we stopped funding higher ed. And they feel that their social mission is to try to get education to less advantaged kids. And so to the degree they can, the, the path that they chose, which is not a good path, is to jack up the price to the middle class and wealthy lower the price there, but the net tuition per student has been has been the same. So every year they raise the price and every year they give more aid. So everybody believes millions of articles that higher ed's 
gotten way more expensive and in fact it hasn't but it's still too expensive so forgetting is it more expensive than 2000 the question is is it too expensive and yes it's way too expensive so when you break down what schools actually spend money on teaching is about 20 25% of the cost of higher ed and again hasn't gone up dramatically because of the larger use of adjuncts um, then you've got research, which almost always is paid for by research grants. At most schools, forgetting overhead, the research is funded. Then you've got the physical plant, which is 15 or 20 percent, including depreciation and amortization. So you build a new building. Maybe it's more efficient than the old building, and so you're spending less on OpEx, but now you've got, even if you got it as a gift, you got to yeah. amortize the cost over time. And then you've got student services and academic support. All the people surrounding instruction, that cost has tripled in the past 15 or 20 years. And it's continuing to rise. And if we want to actually lower the cost of higher ed, that's where we're going to have to do it. Because when you use AI and you use all these tools to try to lower the cost of instruction, what you're really doing is saying, well, we should have a lower amount of engagement between students and faculty, despite all the research that says engagement between students and faculty is, is the most important thing. So that's, you can use AI, you can use good tools to make teaching better, get better retention, get better life outcomes, but you can use good tech to make student support and academic services half as expensive. You can bring it back to where it was in 2000, and that would be a big deal. The other thing I'll mention is you got to start subsidizing higher ed again. Like the cost of higher ed is the same here as it is in England or in Israel or in Australia. Here we double it and then discount back, right? Our discount rate's now 56%. And there they subsidize it. Right. And so there it looks like higher ed costs $5,000 and here it looks like it costs $50,000. In fact, the cost is the same. It's how we present it and how we pay for it. So you're obviously uh, you're you're addicted to starting companies. Um, you know, Noodle is obviously you know thriving and and you got you got a long runway in front of it. Uh, if do you have a new you have another startup in you, or if you were an entrepreneur, what what things would you start today that um, you think the world of education needs? I think I think we're like. Where I'd like to spend my time, like my next chapter is more on public policy. Um, there's some really cool things we could do, uh, especially in K-12. But um, I love startups. I love being involved in them. And I hope to be involved in my kids' startups and I bang on them every day. Um, if I were starting an education startup right now, A... I'd look at uh, micro schools. That is the Wild West. People are giving up on K-12 districts. And yet the alternatives are all over the place. I think there's an opportunity for a real business there. Um, or a couple of real businesses of, of scale. B, you know, I talked about the space in between high school and college. And there's tremendous opportunity there. Like, again... What Gates and other people try to argue is that a high school degree means you're ready for college, as if there's uh, every graduate of that degree is the same and every college is the same. Mm -hmm. So now you look at every school has different needs. Again, the, what you need to walk into a philosophy major at Harvard, what you need to walk into a nursing school, right? Different skill sets. But every kid, like their school taught something a little bit different. That teacher taught it a little bit different. They didn't learn everything of what they learned. They forgot not every kid had a perfect 100 average, right? So there's going to be space. Remediation is not something universities are good at as a rule. Right. And yet, um, and they have a financial incentive to bring in students, right? Knowing that those students need help. Can we think of that market 
of getting you from where you are right now to ready for where you want to be as a market that should probably be subsidized from Title I money, right? Like money we could have spent on K-12. Let's take a little bit of it and earmark it to the students who, yeah. you know, are, are, are our product. And 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 then pay f- pay it back in a sense by university saying, boy, we're saving all this money. If you, in fact, give a students who make it through the first year in good standing, you did a good job getting them ready and we're willing to pay something. Like there should be a market there. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. So we're going to have you back on the program for you to talk specifically specifically about these K-12 policies that you would love to see implemented. But just as we close, you know, give give people perspective on, you know, are you optimistic about the future in terms of what's going on? Are you pessimistic? You know, what should people be looking for? How can they get involved to make a difference? Oh, I'm wildly optimistic, right? Like, we're, I felt this way about the internet in, in 1993. And I, this is the invention of fire. Like there, there are tools that we are getting our heads around uh, as someplace. And they asked an expert, you know, where are we in the movie on AI? And he says, we're about halfway through the trailer, (laughs) right? Like this is very early days, but it's incredibly exciting stuff. And, uh, you know, and you and you look at research, you look at the adoption of electric cars, you know, and a bunch of things we're doing to sort of address climate change, to address energy uh, efficiency. And and uh, the cost of solar energy is now by far and away cheaper than any other source of energy. We just got to pump the gas. Um, everybody's just got to chill out. Like the, the thing about the extreme left and the extreme right. Um, is that they're entirely data free, right? Like you, you look at the difference. What makes someone a centrist is they actually look at the data. Like they actually say, yeah, that hasn't worked in any country that it was, it's been tried. Like right. maybe that's a bad idea. And then somebody says, no, no, it doesn't matter that it's never worked. It's the right answer. Right. It's like, you're an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> So we've we've got to kind of slough off the extremes and say, let's get back to making decisions based on actual reality. Mayor Katzman, this was awesome. Thank you. <laughs>